Welcome back, class. It's good to see you again. Here we are in the true and accurate history of Mongolia, episode 6. We're in 1710 AD. We've established, rather, Genghis Khan has established a new colony on this southern island populated by city states. And they're making overtures in the New World, where the Iroquois and the Inca seem to be coexisting fairly peacefully. If you recall in the last episode, we conquered India, came to the New World, discovered new weaponry with strange inscriptions of Washing Dawn on it, which led to new technologies such as ranged weaponry. Now there are still some barbarians hanging around on the original continent. Rebels, leftovers, people who were not happy with the Mongol conquest of the entire continent. And we can see here, you know, there's dealing with them a little bit over in the remains of India, because that's where they've made their encampment. And down here, Geneva is the next target that Genghis Khan plans to take. And Genghis himself has gone to the southern continent to oversee this attack, to oversee this bit of expansion. You can see him moving out towards the front now. He's left Monka Khan in charge back on the continent, with his son Monka Temur as a second. Monka Temur came to prominence in the conquest of Monaco. Now these new riflemen are slowly making their way over and declaring war in 1740, opening up the way to Geneva and making very short work of its defenders. They really don't stand a chance against the new guns, and the Keshek as well are proving their worth once again. Now many of the city-states in the world have seen Genghis Khan's merciless behavior and are beginning to wonder if perhaps they should be banding together. Now they do so in 1745, shortly after the beginning of the Siege of Geneva, to try and create a buffer zone, a safety and numbers approach to dealing with the Mongol horde. Of course, this means very little to Genghis Khan, who was planning on destroying them all anyway and crushing them under his heel. Now, Seoul uh, openly declared war, which is right next to Old Sarai, but all of Old Sarai's soldiers are currently out at Geneva. This was a bit of a tactical misstep on Genghis Khan's part. However, it's not something that he feels is really a major threat as he's already conquered Geneva by 1750 and is sending his troops back to Old Sarai to defend against the people of Seoul. The city itself is certainly strong enough to hold out until they get back, especially considering that the warriors of Seoul are not as technologically advanced as are those of the Mongols. They see Turfan sending out its first fishing fleet, that city named in honor of the original explorer. It's an exciting time in Mongol history. There are new settlers setting out all the time. This settler is being sent out to the New World to gain a foothold there, and they're just trying to decide based on the maps they've put together what would be the best location. And they're sending out some supporters as well to defend the new settlement once it's eventually founded in many, many years, because it takes a long time to get that far across the ocean. Here we are, Babylon well defended. The Mongols are doing a good job taking care of the barbarian hordes. And the people seem to want cotton. They're very interested in nice clothes in the style uh, that they saw in India while they were conquering it, and which is still worn in that subjugated nation. Uh, Hiawatha is not happy with the actions that Genghis Khan and his, his team are taking against the city-states of the world. But again, Genghis Khan not terribly concerned. There we go. The Iroquois joining in. Iroquois and the Inca both denouncing Genghis Khan's actions. Because as we have seen throughout history, denouncing Genghis Khan is the best way to get on his good side. We can see Karakoram producing yet more of the finest riflemen in the Mongol nation. Sending them off to the New World as well. 
getting ready to gain a foothold, especially now that the people of the New World have demonstrated that they disapprove of Genghis Khan and his methods. Which is perhaps not the best decision the people of the New World could have made, but how could they have known? They met him after he had finished brutally conquering his own continent. Now we can see riflemen making their way into Seoul. The Keshek are having a little bit of trouble. They're beginning to become outclassed in terms of modern warfare, and that is deeply upsetting to Genghis Khan, who has always, well, since their inception, used them as his most trusted frontline troops. We see Old Sarai has produced a cannon, which is a technology that they stole from the people of Seoul, and which Genghis Khan is willing to give a try, despite the fact that historically he has had very little luck with siege weaponry. You see this, the swordsmen are holding out pretty well against even the riflemen, proving their ability, proving their worth. Back over on the main continent, there's just some management taking place as Genghis Khan deals with the aftermath, or rather as Monka Khan deals with the aftermath of the barbarian cleansings. Genghis Khan is busy on the new continent doing what he does best, conquering. Monka Khan, always physically infirm, is left to administer the rest of the country in Genghis Khan's absence. And he is doing a fair job of it. Unsurprisingly, as he is a brilliant man. Now you can see the culture of Mongolia is slow to spread across the back countries that lie between the cities, even on the main continent. And that's something that Monka Khan thinks needs to be uh, rectified. But meanwhile, he sends his son out to oversee the settlement of colonies in the New World, which is going to be a long voyage for him, but Monka Khan surmised correctly that there would be no chance in the near future for Monka Temer, his son, there we go, the conquest of Seoul in 1780, no big deal, with Genghis Khan on the scene. So Monka Khan correctly surmised that his son Monka Timur would have no chance to grow as a commander, grow as a Khan on the main continent, now that all that were left were scattered barbarian encampments. So he sent him off to the New World, where there was sure to be conflict coming soon. Meanwhile, he was uh, working at building the culture of the Mongols in a way that Genghis Khan never bothered to do, because Genghis Khan's concerns of course, conquest, martial things, you know, physical pursuits. Just dealing with a few uh, leftover barbarians who still haven't learned that they are no match for the Mongols, even in the face of greatly superior technology. Here you can see the Keshek taking care of those musket-wielding barbarians. So, as you're saying, Monka Khan's main interest at this point was increasing the cultural power of the Mongols following the examples of the conquered nations. The martial power of the Mongols was already unmatched. Perhaps in the entire world, they did not yet know. But the cultural richness of the nation was lacking, and that was something that Monka Khan aimed to correct. The first step he took in that was authorizing the release to the public of the printing press which gave rise to many newspapers and publications in the Mongol Empire. This was a very exciting time at the end of the 18th century here, as people were beginning to grow literate, were beginning to write things, there was more Mongol poetry being made, and more music being created, or more than uh, the old songs that they sang, songs of conquest, uh, they were singing songs of beauty as well. It was a shift in the focus of the Mongol culture on the mainland in Genghis Khan's absence, one which Genghis Khan may not have approved had he still been on the continent. However, he was quite far away, down in the southern continent here, 
overseeing the conquest of the city-states who stood in his way, and dealing with a few barbarians here and there. So his attention was elsewhere, and Monka Khan was doing what he felt was right. Whether or not this is something that Genghis Khan would have approved of is something which we will see as history continues to unfold. Those stubborn barbarian musket men, finally wiped out by the Keshek, who are becoming more and more outmatched as history continues. And here's our first settler who's made his way to the New World in 1795, where he founds New Sarai, which is, you know, interestingly like Old Sarai, the first city overseas that was ever built that was named in that tradition. The main continent's administration is going well. Monka Khan is doing an excellent job of keeping the country under control. The southern continent only has one enemy left to conquer. And the New World is as rich with resources as they had imagined. There we see Samarkand is founded, which will become the capital of Genghis Khan's forces, the Mongols, in the New World. Samarkand, far in the north of the New World. A rough and ready place for a rough and ready people. See more barbarians trying to uh, step out towards the Mongols. And Monka Khan moving out himself to oversee their conquest. He was admittedly quite bored. And more exploration taking place along the edges of the Incan Empire, which as it turned out was far more vast than that of the Iroquois. Now, Consul Hiawatha of the Iroquois was growing unsettled by the foundation of two new Mongol cities within a short time on his shores. But Genghis Khan's response, or rather Monka Temur's response, as he had been sent to oversee the settlement of the New World, was not diplomatic so much as it was, well, Mongol in its scale. His response was simply, too bad, we are here now, get used to it. Now Genghis is starting up his plans for attacking Brussels, the last remaining city-state in that part of the world. But he has to quickly return to Geneva to oversee some administrative duties, as there are no other cons in the area. The cons are pretty spread out now. We have one per continent, which is not ideal, but that is simply what is required of a rapidly expanding empire. Now, Brussels is growing suspicious, though they were allied with the Mongols thanks to a dispute they had had earlier with Geneva. However, they are beginning to see that the Mongols do not really honor these kinds of agreements. They do not really honor the idea of uh, an alliance, except as a thing of convenience, which they can use for a time to build up their forces and prepare for another assault. And you can see Monka Temer has landed much further south in the New World. His ship was blown off course in transit but that's hardly important. He's going to make his way up to Samarkand and gain valuable experience battling barbarians and uh, mapping the terrain along the way. They're moving very slowly up the coast with the original explorer of the New World, that group of pikemen, whom they have rendezvous with just to the east of the Iroquois nation. This caravel is just sitting near Oslo, one of the city-states in the New World. Genghis Khan is planning whether or not he needs to use that nation as a foothold in the south of the New World. Meanwhile, Monka Khan's cultural advancements are proceeding apace on the old continent. Mongol culture is growing at an astounding rate, especially compared to their progress in the earlier part of their history. See, the cannons are getting some practice firing on targets before they turn their guns on Brussels, as they inevitably will, seeing as they are, of course, the Mongols, and conquest 
is their mandate. Now we're here in the 19th century. More barbarians continue to show up. 1814 proved to be a fairly dull year. All the same. Monka Temer finally made it up to Samarkand that year at least. So that was something. Some workers made their way to Samarkand as well to begin building roads and improvements between Samarkand and New Sarai, the two settlements in the New World. Well, there we see Old Faithful erupting in 1818, much to the delight of the Keshek explorers who were nearby at the time. Here we are going to see the beginnings of a new campaign of conquest in the 19th century on the southern continent and in the New World. So to see that, come back next time. Until then, all the best.